Hello, everybody. This is Lauren Hershey. I'm the senior pastor at Word of Life Church, and we hope this podcast blesses you and helps bring you closer to God. Enjoy today's message. Good morning, Word of Life Church. You are in for a treat today. Pastor Joy and I need to be out of town, so let me introduce to you our guest speaker, Paul Heine. You may know Paul as a great guy, member of the church, and the leader of our men's ministry, and he is all those things, but so much more. Paul and Stephanie come to us from South Africa, where they were involved in business, they were involved in farming, and they were involved in ministry, pastoring three churches, including starting one of them, and also serving on the national board of the Rama family of churches, including the mother church of that organization, a 45,000 member church in in Johannesburg. And so uh, we are so blessed to have Paul and Stephanie be a part of our congregation. Paul's an ordained minister and well-seasoned, well-able to minister. And so church, as he comes to the pulpit, for the first time on Sunday morning, would you stand to your feet and give a good word of life? Welcome to Reverend Paul Heine. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Amen. So good to be together in the presence of the Lord Amen. this morning. Amen. Amen. Seeing as you're still standing and seeing as it's a day of confessions, um, I want you to take your Bible, if you've got one, or your device uh, in your hand. I want you to lift it up, yes. and I want you to make this confession with me. This is my Bible. This is, my Bible. This is the Word of the Lord. This is, the word of the Lord. This is my sword. With this word, I tear down strongholds and every vain thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God in my life, in my family, in the world, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Lauren, for those kind words, really. It sounds to me like you're talking about it. Another person, I don't, <laughs> I don't know where you got all that from, but anyway, um, it was, I'm grateful for that. How many of you know we've got, we're blessed to have really great pastors here at Word of Life? I can only tell you that, that uh, for Steph and I sitting here in the last two and a half years, um, we've just been blessed over and over again by their, their dedication, their, their um, compassion, just the blessing of their ministry, who they are as people, how much they care. And uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of you how wonderful it is to have shepherds like that. We are really blessed. Amen. Um, and this church is a wonderful church. So praise the Lord for that. Um, the title of my message this morning that I believe God wants me to share with you is The God of the Second Chance. And um, as Pastor Lauren has already said um, in his introduction, the book of Jonah, it's a story. Uh, It's a story about a man, a man called to be a prophet, a man who gets a word from God. Um, It's a story about that man's God. It's a story about a God of amazing grace and mercy. How many of you today are grateful for God's grace and mercy? I know I am. Amen. I couldn't imagine life without it. I make so many mistakes. Hallelujah. He's a God of grace and mercy. And it's a wonderful story about a great city and its wicked people, um, about the unwavering love of God, unwavering love of God towards them, and the power of repentance. Sometimes we think that we repented on the day that we gave our life to Jesus, but I've discovered that repentance in my life is an ongoing thing. Uh, I'm sorry that you might have thought differently, but it's just the truth, amen. And many times I've had to get before God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, and then go and do what he tells me to do. And it's not always easy. And so for me, given where I come from, and I might just share a little bit about that later, um, this wonderful story is a reminder 
of God's amazing grace in my life. Amen. Amen. So let's just pray as we get into God's Word. Father, we thank you so much today that you are here with us. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome in this place. And Lord, I know and declare that without you, I have nothing to say. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would just take hold of, 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 of your word this morning and that you would minister through me, uh, Lord, to these precious people here today who need to hear what you are saying, Lord. And always, Lord, your plans and purposes for us are good and not for evil. And so we thank you as we open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's interesting that in the first verses of Jonah, you might want to turn there to chapter 3 if you want to get ready. Um, I thought I had my marker there, but it's okay. We'll find it. Here we go. Jonah chapter 3. Chapter 3. So in, in, we're going to start off by reading together, or I'll read, and you can follow as I read. It's a short chapter, so bear with me. This is what it says. It says, Now the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, came to Jonah the second time. Everybody say, second time. Second. Saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast Herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So it talks about Nineveh being a great city. And as I looked into this, great city not only means large and powerful, because it was a very big city, um, but it also carries the meaning of that this city was important and significant to God. And we might well wonder why. Weren't there other cities, pagan cities, uh, throughout the Middle East or wherever? But this city was of particular importance and significant to God. We need to understand that at that time, Nineveh was the capital and the largest city of the Neo-Assyrian Empire of the time. And for several decades, in fact, it was the largest and most powerful and influential city in the world. Nineveh was a melting pot of demonic idolatry. They had gods for everything and a very, very evil city in its practices. So you can imagine as God looked down and saw the, the spread of its influence on the nation that it had conquered, many, many nations that it moved him to do something about that, because we could see that these people were going to perish. Amen. So our God, you need to know today, is a God of wonderful compassion and, his, and mercy. And he's always ready and wanting and willing to act in the lives of people, uh, if by any means he can rescue them from eternal destruction. Hallelujah. And if you're here today and you haven't heard that before, well, God bless you. You will experience that too. Um, so Nineveh, in fact, um, 
had a pantheon of gods, uh, and in particular, and this is what's interesting, she was devoted, the chief god was the goddess of Inanna, or as she was more commonly known then, Ishtar, uh, known as Astarte in Greece and Venus in Rome. She was the goddess of love, not Christian love, but she was the goddess of love, of war and killing, of destruction. She was the goddess of sex and fertility. And she was also associated with sensuality, sexuality, procreation, divine law, as the people saw it, and, um, and of political power. People would come to Ishtar for favors, and particularly people that sought um, to have power would sacrifice to her in order to get favor and power from her. And so as the goddess of sexuality, she moved her followers to defy or even redefine social boundaries, particularly those related to gender roles. Men who became priests of Ishtar would sometimes assume non-binary gender roles. They would dress in women's clothing, and they were allowed and encouraged to engage in every form of sexual perversion. Are we standing and hearing something familiar? Amen. I think it's a very apt parallel for the times that we're living in. And one might even say Ishtar is back again. Now the Assyrian king in the story is most likely the very powerful Ashurbanipal, known for his violence, his cruelty, his brutality. And if you were to visit the British Museum today, you'd be able to go to a section of the museum, the ancient history part, and you could see the clay tablets that archaeologists excavated from Nineveh, from the ruins of Nineveh. And they stand there today, and they're full of cuneiform writing. You can look it up on Google or Wikipedia and see it. And it, it's most of all a description of this king and some of his, um, what do you call it, others as well, but mainly him and, uh, and his, his wars and his battles and his government. And it describes in detail how cruel he was. You know, in a battle when the, when the war was ended, he would cut off all the heads of all the fallen soldiers, bring them in piles and put them in front of the people that had resisted him. Um, he would skin people alive, all to just drive fear into the hearts of anyone that might think that they could come against him. He was an extremely evil man, the head of an extremely evil empire. But God looks down and says, it's enough. And I wonder sometimes, are we not living in a time like that when God might be looking down and saying, and getting ready because it's time to say it's enough. I believe, brothers and sisters, we are living in the end of the age. Amen. Amen. I really do. Um, so because Jonah is a story, as we said, just like the parable that Jesus taught, its purpose is for us to see our own self in the person or perhaps persons in the story. Amen. And I didn't like that either, but... I had to settle with it as I was studying it. Amen. Hallelujah. But brothers and sisters, it's a very encouraging story because it answers some very important questions that are as relevant as they were for the Ninevites um, as they are for us today. Amen. Um, one of the questions might be this. Is it possible for a nation, a people, an individual person, to change or to modify their lives, to change direction, even to avoid the judgment of God. Yeah. It's a time for us, me and you, to stop making the same mistakes, having the same arguments, waiting to grow up and get wise. Amen. Get wise. How is it that we... Find it so difficult to learn from our mistakes. Amen. We go on repeating them again and again until God draws the line. Amen. But brothers and sisters, the good news, the good news is that the Word of God has power. That's why we made that confession at the beginning. The Word of God has power through the Holy Spirit to bring about repentance. 
we don't want to repent. We're too proud. We don't want to have to admit, it was me. No, it, was, it, it, it was the woman you gave me. <laughs> uh, and so on and so on, amen? Or, you know, you didn't give me a chance with the right career. Or I never inherited any money. Or I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. You know, we, we, we'll try anything but repent. And say, yes, Lord, it was me. Amen. It was me. Amen. Deal with me, Lord. And get into a place, if not real tears, but of spiritual weeping before the Lord for the evil that we have accommodated in our lives. Amen? We need to face the fact. And I've discovered, even as a born-again Christian, filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit, too many times have I needed to repent. In my relationship with my beautiful wife, looking back uh, how I was as a father, my financial management, business decisions, all over, uh, I see places, and I've had to deal with that and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I didn't listen. I, I, I did my own thing. I, I wasn't willing to, to, to receive the counsel. Amen. And so repentance is something that uh, when we get into the Word of God, when we sit under the ministry of the Word, it can begin to rise up in our hearts and we begin to accept the fact that we need to do something about that. Amen. Repentance has the power and the word of, through the Word of God to bring about change, to make us new, even to be spiritually born again, to become a whole new person, to be able to leave the old person completely behind. Amen. No strings attached. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Leave them behind. Um, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to lead us into a life in abundance. How many people here today really believe in your heart that God's will is for you to enjoy abundant life? Yes, amen. I don't mean just here, I mean right here, amen. right? Amen. Because He's a good God, amen. He designed us to enjoy uh, His creation, to enjoy Him, to be in His presence, to, to, to just be blessed. Amen. Not to weep and cry and regret and, and all of that, but to be blessed. Amen? Amen. And so God's will is for us to enjoy life in abundance. And when we, when we decided in the garden that actually we, 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 that wasn't enough, uh, and we listened to the devil, God didn't give up there. But he put into place the plan that he had already before the beginning of time, before the creation of the world, to make sure that we could still enjoy abundant living here in the earth and later on fully, totally in His presence in heaven. How wonderful is that? Amen. How absolutely wonderful is that? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Um, he wants us to experience the joy and the blessing of a faith that overcomes, no matter the temptation, no matter the trial or the test that we may be facing. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I ministered to the men recently by email. It says that there is no temptation that has overtaken you, except that which is common to man, and except that which everyone experiences. But you need to know this, the Lord says, that in every temptation, I will provide a way out, so that you will not have to bear it or collapse under it for it to overcome you. In every temptation, there's a way out. And I want to say to you this morning, obviously, the, the, the first way is through the Word. What does the Word say about that situation? What is it that I can declare and confess over that situation that is truth? Amen? And get that established in my life. This thing is not of God. And I don't have to have it in my life. Show it the door. Show that spirit the door. Amen? I love, you know, you know the Bible talks about Jesus crushed the serpent's head. I like that picture because sometimes I have to do that. Ah, I have to really crush that rattlesnake's head. Amen? Yeah, you, you know, we, we are too passive. We just accept everything that's going on. We don't get up and fight. But we need to based on what God's Word says because then we're always going to win. Hallelujah. There's one thing the devil can't stand is when we start confessing the Word of God. Amen. So brothers and sisters, I want to share with you from Jonah chapter 3 this morning, three principles which, if you will be a doer and not a hearer only, will help you to keep moving forward and, up to, and upward into all that God has purposed for your life. This has been my experience of God in my life. There are many reasons, and I might still refer to it, as to why I shouldn't be here today. 
Many reasons that are related to me and my sin. Amen. But God's grace and God's mercy has done wonderful things. And the older you get, so rejoice in getting older because it helps you to see more and more how God's grace and how God's presence was with you all the way. Even though you messed up. Even though you, you suffered pain, heartache. Even though there are things in your life that you that you've struggled to shake off because of guilt or devil still speaking condemnation. But God has been with you every step of the way. Hallelujah. Because he's a good God, as we sang today. So three principles. The first one that I want to share with you uh, is that we need to be quick to respond. In verse 1 and 2, the scripture says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I mean, Jonah got the first commission from God, a a direct word, very clear word, but for reasons of his own, he was not willing to do that because the people that God was sending to him were his enemies. And God was wanting to, to, to provide an act of amazing love to Israel's enemies. And he couldn't handle that. You know? He said, these are the people that are going to come against us one day who have made it clear that they don't tolerate any other people and they're going to want to destroy us. So he wasn't really at all keen. That was the first time. But the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I mean, it's amazing that God is saying, well, Jonah, you are the guy that I need to use. It's you that I, that I need to do that. Because when you speak, they'll listen. <laughs> You need this. I don't, there's no other prophet that can do what I need you to do right now. Amen. Amen. And so he hears the word of the Lord, and the Lord says, Now get up. He doesn't say, Pack your things, tidy up, make sure everything's in the right place, you know, park the car. uh, You know, he doesn't, he just says, Arise, go to Nineveh. Now, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So it seems to me that at this stage, Jonah didn't even exactly know what he was supposed to say. <laughs> Amen. He said, I'll tell you the message that I will tell you. And so we see that the reluctant, disobedient, and selfish prophet. Now, I said maybe when we listen to a story like this, we might just see ourselves in some of these people. Amen. And so the reluctant, disobedient, and selfish prophet gets a second chance. Praise God that he's a God of the second chance. And the third. And the fourth. However many you need to get to the place where he wants you to be, he's there for you. Amen. Because you missed it the first time, and the second and the third, doesn't mean you should give up on God or that you should think he's given up on you. He never will. He never will. Never will he give up on you. Hallelujah. Because our God is a God of mercy and grace. He's the God of another chance. Even when we miss it again, And again, and again. All we need to do is turn to Him. Hear what He says, and do what He's asking us to do. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. And so, brothers and sisters, as Christians, how many of you know that God often asks us to do things that we don't really want to do? They make us uncomfortable. God is saying, listen... I know that person hurt you and offended you, but you know what? I want you to go to them and tell them that you forgive them. Whatever he says you to do, amen. But, oh, how our flesh resisted. But it wasn't me. I didn't deserve this. It was them. They came at me for nothing. And we've got all of the stuff that we want to put in the way between doing what God wants us to do. But the most powerful thing is when we obey what God says because he's, he's underwritten the results. Hallelujah. Amen? Praise God. And so like Jonah, what we do is, instead of doing what God tells us to do, we head off in another direction. The storms of life may come as a result of that, just like it was with Jonah. And, but more often than not, God allows us just to continue down the path away from obedience for a season, but for grace. Hallelujah. There will come a day when, like Jonah, we know it's time to return to God. Our spirit knows that safety and security, mercy and forgiveness, joy is found in the Lord's presence. It just knows that. We're the ones that try to suppress it. 
The devil is the one that does everything to keep us from doing that. But our spirits know. And if we will just listen uh, and go with what uh, the Spirit is saying to our spirit, then we'll see God do the wonderful things that we've been hoping for for so long. We know it's time to return to God and to worship Him and to offer ourselves to Him anew. Sometimes we need to do that. We need to, you know what, this flesh, oh, it's got resurrection power. We get born again, we put ourselves on the altar, Lord, my life is all yours, and about three months later we crawl off the altar again and carry on as before. But we need, that's why we, there are times when we need to get, realize that we've moved away and we need to rededicate and re, re, recommit ourselves to being that living sacrifice that he values so highly. Hallelujah. But guess what, brothers and sisters? God never allows us to go to step two until we have completed step one. He doesn't say, well, you didn't do what I originally asked you to do. But that's okay. You've got, a, you've got a bar. I'll let you skip it so that you can move on in your Christian life. No. When we desire to get back on track with God, He says to us, fine, are you ready to obey me now? Are you ready to do what I originally asked you to do? Because He's the God of the second chance. Hallelujah. Even as many chances as you need. Amen. Amen. You know, I think about this, and yeah, we'll get there. I won't jump ahead of myself. So brothers and sisters, if we want to walk forward into God's awesome plan for our lives, then we're going to have to shut the door on the past, which is easy to say, but sometimes it's not so easy to do. But God never asks us to do something that He's not standing with us to give us the power to do if we will trust Him, if we will deny our own strength. And be honest and say, Lord, I don't know whether I can do this, but I know you can help me. And I want to do your will. Amen? Are we on the same page here today? Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, so if we want to move forward into God's awesome plan for our lives, then we're going to have to, to shut the door on the past. You have to give up your grief, your guilt, your grudges, your victimhood. So that you can move forward in faith. Hallelujah. Because these things are designed by the devil to bind us. You know? I understand that there's a time of mourning. But there's also a time of rejoicing. But some people decide to mourn the whole of the rest of their lives. And they're locked into that dark place for the rest of their lives. And I say that with respect. I am a person who's lost loved ones. So I can tell you that I know what I'm talking about. Um, I... If, 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 you know, if I look at my life, I can just see how I was set up to fail. It's like everything was stacked against me. My mother was 19, my father 40 when I was born. I, um, I wasn't the reason why they married. I wasn't born out of wedlock, but that was what it was. Three months, when I was three months old, my, um, my mother ran away. So I never knew my, my own mother, which is okay, anyway. And, um, and, uh, yeah, uh, there's so much, but I don't want to bring it in on me. But I, just to illustrate the fact that, you know, the way that your life works out does not mean that you have to submit to that. God is working. Yeah. Yeah. When I was 14 years old, I came home. I'd been a weekend away with a friend. I came home from that weekend outing to the news that, well, as I came down the street with a person who was bringing me back, I saw all these cars parked. And so it turned out that my parents and my brother, my half-brother, because um, my father remarried, had all been killed in one accident. And so there I was, an orphan at 14. No direction. My father was a very angry man from the war, but uh, and he wasn't a mentor. He wasn't a father, really. He just didn't know how. You know, he didn't drink. He didn't do any of those things, but he just didn't know how. Never sowed into my life much more than really negativity. There was a positive. Uh, he was the chief engineer in a, in a chocolate factory. So on Saturdays, I got to go with him. <laughs> and I could take whatever I wanted. <laughs> the praise the Lord. For I'm just trying to say, you know, um, sometimes we, 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 we've got all these excuses that, wow, you know, we never had a chance and, and, and this didn't happen and that was against us and that went wrong and, and so on. And, and, we, and we did But I'm just here to tell you that I'm one of those that was set up 
for failure. Amen. But I want to also tell you this, again, that God can turn all things to good. Hallelujah. That which the enemy sought for evil, God turns to good. One of those things for me, um, I, was in, I came out of high school, grade 12, and um, I went into, we had to do compulsory military service of one year. And um, in that time, I, 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 I didn't lose my faith, but I lost, I lost connection with God. I, I, did, I lost the, yeah. And, um, and uh, <laughs> I used to come and visit Steph on the farm where she was then. I'd met her by that time already. And, you know, she wasn't even impressed by my uniform, you know. <laughs> So, but um, yeah, again, that, I, I don't want to focus on, 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 but I just have to say that God brought it into my life supernaturally. Amen. And, um, and that which the enemy tried to use for evil and these things that happened with me, and I'm just saying they impacted me. They, they, I, I struggled academically. I just got out of high school. I never made it to college. I'm standing here before you today never having made it to college. Um, and, but God can take someone and make something out of it. He just needs a little bit from us, you know, a little bit of, of willingness. So I'm just saying, you know, um, whatever has been happening in your life, some of it will be circumstances. Some of it will be the way that you've responded. Some of it is you need to repent. Some of it has been your own fault. I know that in many ways I could have done better if I'd been more disciplined, or whatever it might be. But God is bigger than any of that. And His love is far greater than we can really comprehend. Amen? Amen. Amen. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul and what he said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, in the Living Bible. He writes and he says, Dear brothers, I am still not all I should be. And I stand before you today with that knowledge, that I'm still not all that I should be. But I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing. So he he says, at this point, I need to keep this focus. Forgetting the past. Because Paul had a past, a horrible past. He was an enemy of Christ, an enemy of the church. He was a murderer, a consenting murderer. Um, He persecuted the church. He tried to close down church. He did everything to resist Jesus until one day Jesus met with him. Amen. Amen. And um, and so he realized he could could say, there's so so much guilt associated with me. I'm not worthy. I, 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 I shouldn't be doing this. But he realized that he needs to forget the past and look forward to what lies ahead. That's what it means to be born again, to be able to leave the past and to have a fresh start, a second start, completely free of whatever it was that went on in your past. Because why? Because when you get born again, the blood of Jesus cleanses and washes it all away and makes you white as the Iowa snow. Hallelujah. (laughs) You've got so many opportunities here to look out in winter and see That's what the Lord made me to be. Hallelujah. You know, the first time we flew to visit Carl here in Dubuque, I remember as we came over the Atlantic and down through Canada, and that year had been heavy snow, and I remember looking down, and everything was covered in snow. Every small lake, pond, forest, even the forest, you couldn't pick them out. And and I thought to myself, that's what it's like. We washed white, completely clean. Hallelujah by the precious blood of Jesus. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain, he says, to reach the end of the race, to receive the prize for which God is calling us. He didn't say calling me. He said calling us. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful that I'm included. (laughs) Calling us up to heaven because of what Christ did for us. If we had to do it, how many of you know we wouldn't be on our way? We'd be still wheel spinning uh, in in the dust. But Christ Jesus did it for us at the cross. Hallelujah. It's a reminder of a story I found about a a football team. Now, 
Now, in South Africa, football means soccer, but in America, it means something different. So we'll go with the American version. Amen. Amen. It's a story about New Year's Day, 1929. Georgia Tech played against the University of California in the Rose Bowl. During the game, a man named Roy Regals, playing for California, recovered a fumble. However, he became disoriented and started running 65 yards in the wrong direction. This never happens in South African rugby. It must be an American thing because it, it's such a confusing game. People all over the place. But anyway, so he started running in the wrong direction. His teammate, Benny Long, managed to catch up with him just before he scored for the opposing team. California attempted to punt, but Georgia Tech blocked the kick and scored a safety, which ultimately determined the game's outcome. At halftime, Everyone wondered what Coach Price would do with Roy Regal. The young man was devastated, believing he had ruined everything. Coach Price, however, surprised everyone. When the timekeeper announced three minutes before the second half, Coach Price simply said, Men, the same team that played the first half will start the second. Regal hesitated, unable to face the crowd. But Coach Price encouraged him, Roy, get up and go back. The game is only half over. Amen. So Roy Regals returned to the field in his second half performance. Hallelujah. How many of you are ready for a second half in your lives? Eh? A second half performance was nothing short of remarkable. The tech players later attested that they had never seen anyone play football as well as Regals did during those crucial moments. And so, brothers and sisters, this story reminds us that sometimes life gives us a second chance. And it's up to us to make the most of it. In fact, we need to understand that every setback can be an opportunity for a second chance. Hallelujah. Try again. Get before the Lord. Get counsel from the Lord. Get counsel from others. Get counsel from your pastor. Sit before the Lord again. Get into the Word and start out again. Hallelujah. Are we still, to, are you still with me this morning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Jonah's second call to Nineveh is a wonderful assurance of God's amazing grace, isn't it? His steadfast love, the steadfast love of God, new every morning. Did you know that every morning is like a second chance? Because his steadfast love is new yeah. every morning. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful assurance of God's amazing grace, his steadfast love and his immovable faithfulness. Always the same. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hallelujah. The second principle is that we need to be quick to obey. Look, look what verse 3 and 4 says. So Jonah arose. He arose. He obeyed God and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, and this he said, remember, the Lord said, oh, you say what I tell you to say. Yet 40 days. 40 is an interesting number in the Bible. 40 is often a time of trial and testing. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness, and when he came out having had victory over the devil, the Bible said he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So 40 days. It's not like the Lord said, in 24 hours, it's all over for you, God. No, 40 days. That in itself shows grace. He knew that there were many in Nineveh that would have to figure this one out. You know? You mean, you mean, you know, mean stop going to Ishtar's temple? Stop practicing those things? Putting our children in the fire? They, they, they had to work through some stuff. And again, it's just, you know, he knows us so well yeah. that he knows that, that, that we need time sometimes to work on things. But that doesn't mean he's pulled back. He's still working. Hallelujah. Forty days, and none of us shall be overthrown. Overthrown, it's the same word that's used about Sodom and Gomorrah. God is saying, I'm going to flatten it. I'm going to flatten it. In fact, the ruins of Nineveh still exist to this day. Just outside the city of Mosul, 
on the Tigris Riverbank. There is the ruins of, I don't know if there's any veterans of, of, of Desert Storm or the Gulf Wars but that have been to Mosul, but it's there, uh, and the ruins are there. It's flattened. And, and f up until just about 10 years ago, there was like only one part of it that was still standing, and it was the gate of Ishtar. A very powerful demonic spirit. And the ISIS blew it up. So you can't go and see it anymore. But there are pictures on Wikipedia of the gate of Ishtar, which is one of the most significant gates. Because you know that through the gates come spirits and all kinds of things. It's an entry point. Amen. So that was for free. All right. Um, <laughs> You know, and on this issue of obedience, I remember so well when, when God confirmed in my heart uh, that, that, that He was calling us to, 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 to launch, to plant a church. I don't know what you call it here. Uh, I was still on the farm and in business at the time, and um, I remember saying to the Lord, well, that's cool. I think our home group had grown to about 20 people by that time, so we had a good call. And I remember saying to the Lord, well, Lord, that's cool, but, 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 but you know how much debt we've got? You know, I, I can't go and serve you when I've got all this debt. And the Lord went quiet. Now, about three months, I forget the exact time uh, and what it was. And um, all of a sudden, the word of the Lord came again. Plant the church. And I realized that what God was saying was, it's time to step out in faith. And trust me, if I'm calling you, I'll take care of the rest. So we announced to our people, and we planned our first service and took place in the farmer's hall in our little village. And from there, you know, God began to do great things. I don't know how exactly it, long it was after that. After that, maybe three months, and all of a sudden, because I'd been saying to the Lord, Lord, you know, your word says that we need to be debt-free and owe no one anything but the debt of love. And... Um, and I said, because God had put it into our hearts long before that to want to be debt free so that we could serve Him without restriction. And so, three months after we had our first service, run about there, all of a sudden, sold the printing company, sold two farms, we're left with two, and we're completely debt free. That's more than 20 years ago, longer. And we, you know, and we've lived debt-free ever since. And God's blessing has just been there and His provision. And, and um, yeah, so it pays to obey God. Amen. So Jonah discovered to his cost that obedience is the shortest distance between two points. You know, Jonah, he was headed to the Costa de Sol. Did you know that? Tortesos, where he was goes, on the coast of Spain, where the Costa de Sol went, you know. But, you know, he didn't have to go by a ship halfway and then sink or thrown and, and then in a submarine and be brought to shore and then have to walk or hitchhike all the way to Nineveh. You know, when you see from the second time, when he went straight to Nineveh, did what God told him to do, he could have got on a plane and taken the direct flight all the way. <laughs> I mean, he didn't have to go round and round the park. That's what I'm trying to say. Amen. So uh, he discovered to his cost that obedience is the shortest distance between two points. And so this time, Jonah obeyed God's command without further delay. We also need to understand that sometimes delayed obedience is not obedience at all. And so Jonah arose immediately and went to Nineveh in obedience to the word of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, I can say that in my time as a, as a pastor, I've talked with, with many Christians, obviously, who wanted to be used by God, who were tired of being stuck somewhere in their lives, who knew that they needed to move on, that, that there were better things out there for them. Um, they come and they want answers from God. They want to hear from God. They wanted God to give them direction in life. But so many of them, I'm sorry to say, we're not doing the plain and simple things that God had revealed to them already and asked them to do. Be ye reconciled. Love one another as I have loved you. Uh, 
become a, a giver rather than wanting only to receive. Many things, simple things, basic things. Um, and what they needed to do, they just needed to obey. Sometimes some would come and say, well, Pastor, um, God has told me to do A, B, or C, marry this person or, or invest in this, what I could see, harebrain scheme or whatever, you know. And I would say to them, I'm sorry, but if God has appointed me as your shepherd, how come he hasn't told me? You know, and I, I have a real check about this. I think you need to slow down. Then they're offended. Now a pastor's trying to stop me from doing and getting to what I need to do, you know. And then they go off and do their thing. And later on, you hear that they crashed. Amen. Not to bring anyone into condemnation, to encourage you to be part of a church like this is such a great blessing. To have a pastor of 38 years that is so wise and so experienced. I, I, I attended the, the um, funeral. We attended the funeral on Friday of, of Brother Ed West. Just his ministry was just such a blessing. Just so amazing. And so we need to understand that we need to respect the call of God and the anointing that is on him. Now, these people were not reading their Bible. They were not praying. They were not attending church, or infrequently at least. They did not want to listen to counsel and make the necessary changes and adjustments. They just wanted a miracle, a shortcut. It was a different place um, for every person. But obedience with God, my brothers and sisters, listen to this. It's like running hurdles in track. You can't go around. You have to go over. Oh, it's too high. I'm too short. No. Go back. <laughs> Amen. Keep, keep at it until you go over. Amen. And how many of you remember in Numbers chapter 14, you know, God has brought the Israelites to the promised land out of Egypt as he promised. They're there. They send in the spies. Ten come back, say, we can't do it. They're too big. All sorts of reasons why it's not going to work. Not one except for Joseph and, uh, Joshua and Caleb say, yes, but we can. We can because our God Amen. is with us. Amen. He's told us to go in. That's what's important. Not how big the enemy is. And so there they are. And Moses, or oh, God speaks to them through Moses and he gives them this word, Numbers 14, 22, 25. So it is true that not one of the men who has seen my glory, this is God speaking, seen my glory, seen me take them out of Egypt. It was still that generation. And the miracles I did both in Egypt and in the wilderness. And ten times, Lord, refused to trust me and obey me. Shall even see the land I promised to this people's ancestors. But my servant Caleb is a different kind of man. Look what it says. He has obeyed me fully. Yes. I will bring him. I think of the King James that says he has a different spirit. He has obeyed me fully. I will bring him into the land he entered as a spy, and his descendants shall have their full share. Yeah. How many want a full share? Or do you just want a little bit? No, the full share. A full share in it. But now, since the people of Israel are so afraid of the Amalekites and the Canaanites living in the valleys, tomorrow you must turn back into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. How many of you know how long they now we had to go and wander in the wilderness? 40 years. Amen. Obedience. King Henry of Bavaria, who reigned around about the 11th century, became weary of being king. He applied to be admitted as a monk at the local monastery. The king told the leader of the monastery of his, sing, of his struggle and his personal battles as king. So the chief abbot said to him, my king, do you understand that the pledge here is one of obedience? That will be difficult for you because you have been a king. King Henry responded and said, yes, I understand. I will live the rest of my life being obedient to you as Christ leads you. Now he stepped right into it there. So the abbot says to him, then I'll tell you what to do. Thing is, you pledged obedience to me. Then I'll tell you what to do. Go back to your throne. And serve faithfully in the place God has placed you in. Hallelujah. And sometimes we need to go back to the throne, to the throne room, to the place 
of commission, the place where God spoke and where God uh, told us what to do. And so when the king died, it was written of him, the king learned to rule by being obedient. Hallelujah. So sometimes God reveals his plan step by step, and our faithfulness lies in following each instruction without hesitation. It seems to me, and it's been my experience, that too many people are looking for a green light from the Lord. They've already got the thing that they want to do. They, they're drawn to this particular, call it a call, or, or, or business deal, or investment, or, 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 or relationship, whatever it might be. And they want a green light for that. But it's been my experience that a lot of the time, if not often, most of the time, God leads by a red light. Don't. The pastor says, look, I think we need to slow down here. Slow down. Let's just have a look at this thing, you know, and, and, and see what exactly are the issues surrounding this thing. Whatever it might be. Uh, uh, counsel, people in the church that have walked with the Lord a long time, get counsel from them, uh, and so on. But don't expect always a green light. Respect the fact that God sometimes says no, not now. Amen. That may be later, but not now. There's other things that you need to focus on. Hallelujah. Um, as Samuel said to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of ram. And the third and last principle is this. We need to be quick to repent. Amen. Amen. Oh, it takes us a long time sometimes. And we argue with God and we, with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but we need to be quick to repent. The Bible says that the people of Nineveh, verses 5 to 6, believed God. That word that's translated believe there um, means, means actually to trust in. So they moved from trusting their gods and Ishtar and put themselves, their trust in Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Jonah. Amen? So it's not just believe. It's trust with everything that you are to, 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 to put yourself on the line. Believe God, proclaim the fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his son and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And so Jonah's message had a profound impact on Nineveh. They believed God. The people responded wholeheartedly. They fasted. They repented and they turned from their evil ways. And the sincerity of their response, because it was visible, they were moved. They even got their flocks and animals to repent. I mean, can you imagine when they withheld feed from these animals, what the noise must have been like of these animals in the stalls crying for food? also cry, even though they were forced to, but, but the, you know, the whole atmosphere. Um, they believed God and they responded wholeheartedly. So the sincerity of their heart response moved God's heart to compassion so that he spared the city from destruction. It's, it's, it's an awesome picture. Amen. So in, it reminds us also of Paul in Acts chapter 16 and verse 19. He's on his way to Rome, but he has to spend time in Caesarea there. And he's brought before King Agrippa. And um, he says these amazing words. He says to King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. Turn to God and do works befitting repentance. Do works befitting, works that demonstrate the truth of their repentance. And you know, repentance in the Bible, we often associate repentance with, you know, being sorry. You know, and we taught Matthew we need to be sorry for our sins, and there is that aspect of it. But we also know that repentance, uh, we've been taught that means to turn away from, to change direction, both in the old and the new, the two different words are, tr are translated that way, to turn away from. Um, but there's another meaning which is also belongs there, and it's to change your mind, to change the way you think. And that is often for us, we have wrong thoughts about God because we're not in the Word, or we don't come to church to get good teaching, and so we think wrongly about spiritual things. We are deceived. 
And so repentance includes that, to, to, to change the way I think, to let God give me a new mind. Um, as it says in Romans 12, 22, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, um, of, of Ishtar and all the others, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Amen? Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So my brothers and sisters, we need to believe God when He says we got it wrong. We need to always agree with and respond to His Word. We need to accept responsibility for our sins and their consequences. That doesn't mean we need to assume a labor of guilt, but when we take responsibility, then we can also know that God has washed it away and forgiven us, past, present, and to come. And we can live in total freedom. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, that we are free from condemnation doesn't just mean that we, we're free from guilt. It means that. But it also means we're free from legal, judicial condemnation, the sentence of guilt yeah. on our sins. And we're only free because our sin was put on Jesus. Amen. He bear, bore our sin. He took the condemnation so that we could live without condemnation in the joy and freedom of knowing that we're on our way to see our blessed Savior face to face. Hallelujah. And so as we pull it together this morning, um, we need to accept responsibility for our sins and their consequences and to accept His offer of salvation and deliverance. It says in verse 10, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways, and God relented from the disaster that He had said He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. Did you know that God also repents? Yes. <laughs> that word relented in the King James is translated repented because it means, it can also mean to change the way you think. That's right. Amen. So I'm so glad that God is willing to be persuaded to change his mind sometime. I mean, it says in the Bible that when God saw the evil of men on the earth, it repented him that he'd made man. So he decided to destroy them all and raise up a new generation through Noah. He changed his mind about whether it was a good thing or not that he'd created man. Okay, that's just for me. Okay, that's not new doctrine or anything like that. It's just the way I see it. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, this morning salvation is as close as a prayer. That's all it takes. A heart that's open to God to say, oh, Lord, I've missed it many times. But thank you, Lord. You're here today for me. I'm glad I came to this particular service. Because I needed to hear this word. See, brothers and sisters, deliverance is always at hand. Deliverance was there for, for Nineveh. It's always at hand. Because God wants to take us to the next level. He doesn't want you to stay where you are, physically, spiritually, mentally. He wants to move you to bigger things. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And it's all bound in a greater knowledge of Him and His goodness and His mercy for our lives. He wants us to enjoy the blessings of abundant life in the spiritual Canaan, promised to us by Jesus, because He is our Redeemer. Just as the Israelites came to the physical Canaan, God wanted to give them the land, He said, that, and fields that you did not plant, um, houses that you did not build, vineyards that you did not tend. So all types and shadows of the good things that Jesus, our forerunner, got for us. They're free to us, yes. but they cost Him everything. Yes. Amen. Yes. And we should not be indifferent about the blessings of our spiritual Canaan. We need to go in and possess it. We need to occupy it. Amen. We need to extend it to include others, the Gentiles perhaps, that God also wants to reach. Amen. Amen. But a wonderful thing is to know that there's a spiritual Canaan prepared for us. We don't have to go the enemy, you know, with, 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 with the Israelites, God said, I will drive out the enemy, but you're going to have to go in and confront them. In our spiritual Canaan, the enemy has already been neutralized at the cross and at the grave. Hallelujah. God has made a, Jesus made a show of him openly to show us that he's got no power. He's got nothing in us anymore. Hallelujah. Our spiritual Canaan. And lastly, this scripture, well, one more um, to, after this. Matthew 12, verse 40, in the Living Bible, when they demanded proof that he was who he claimed to be, he said, Jesus replied, only an evil, faithless generation would ask for further proof. 
and none will be given except what happened to Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was in the great fish for three days and three nights, so I, the Messiah, shall be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh, this is heavy, the men of Nineveh shall rise against this nation at the judgment and condemn you. For when Jonah preached to them, they repented and turned to God from all their evil ways. And now here today is one greater than Jonah, Jesus, and you refuse to believe him. That he is the Messiah, the Son of God, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, Lion of the tribe of Judah, author and finisher of our salvation, Bishop of our souls, the Lily and the Valley, and the Rose of Sharon. Hallelujah. Jesus, Amen. our Lord and our Savior. And so, brothers and sisters, repentance always precedes revival. And I believe in all of my heart that the church in this day and season, I'm not only speaking about us, that we, we need a season. We, we need revival. We need, we need to repent and say, Lord, I've got, I'm sorry, I've got used to you. I've got used to church. I've been there, done that. There's almost, like, I'm not saying that people are specifically saying that, but there's almost an attitude of that. Why should I go to church? It's not like it used to be. And then there was COVID, you know, and, and I can watch church on you know, on, 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 on the TV. That, that, that's not going to bring revival. But when we come before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me, I've slidden back. I've slidden back. And I don't really, I realize that I haven't cared as much as I should have about those around me that are perishing. Will you please bring revival to me first yeah. in my heart? Not revive our church, Lord. Revive our church. Do something about the music. Why do they always sing the same songs? No, 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 no. Rev me, Lord, me. Forgive me. Come into my heart afresh. Stir me up again. And then stir us up as a congregation because, Lord, we're hungry and passionate about the lost. Amen? We want the lost, Lord, to fill these empty seats. It's tragic that there are so many empty seats in a church like ours that has so much to offer. Okay, now I'm really closing, okay? Am I in trouble with the time? I think I am. Ooh. I'm not looking forward to my meeting with Pastor Lauren. Ooh. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm talking about revival and the blessings of revival. 28 verses 1 to 14. God is speaking. Through Moses. Now it shall come to pass. Everybody say, it shall come to pass. Not it might, or I hope, it shall. I, I, I so appreciate this about the word of God. He's so definite. It shall come to pass. That makes it a promise. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. We sang it. Thank you, Morgan. Will overtake you because you obey the voice. Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And this is what it is. Blessed shall you be in the city. And blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, 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 sorry. Blessed and of the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord, hallelujah, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you Every demonic spirit, or those that oppose you, will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Hallelujah. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. And he will bless you. He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That, of course, can be America, but it's more significantly Canaan. 
spiritual Canaan for us. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. Holy means separated, sanctified, set apart for God only. As a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give the rain on your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head <laughs> and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath. If you heed, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods, to go after Ishtar, or to serve them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Shall we just bow our heads in the presence of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. Father, we're so grateful to you, Lord, for your awesome presence here today. Mighty, wonderful Holy Spirit. And as we sit here, Lord, we just ask you to just deal with us, first of all, individually. Lord, that you would just help us to get past some of the things, the hurdles perhaps that we've tried to go around. Lord, forgive us for our disobedience, for our slowness to respond for our lack of repentance. But Lord, we thank you too that we're not under condemnation. You're not trying to knock us down or knock us back or hold back from us that which is rightfully ours. We just ask you, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to just make the adjustments, change our way of thinking. And place ourselves before you, Lord, as those who are just hungry or needing a new start, Lord. A second chance. Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is moving in this place. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I just feel this morning, as I prayed about what God wanted to do, that it might be good for us to just open the altar. And for people who just feel that this word was for them to be able to just come forward and just stand or kneel or lie face down in the presence of the Lord this morning and just allow Him to wash over you. Because He does. He wants to do that. He wants to meet you where you're at. Not in condemnation, but in joy to say, you're my child. I love you. I've got good things for you. The plans that I prepared for you are for good and not for evil to give you a hope and a future, says the Lord. So I just encourage you to just, maybe right where you are, just stand up and leave your seat and come forward here to the altar. And um, I'll trust the Lord to pray for you. Lay hands if he wants me to lay hands. Whatever God wants to do. Amen. Thank you, Father. Tirava kustundurebe shilemenderebe seka sandi aravasta basse. Hallelujah. Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. He will lift you up. Hallelujah. In moments like this, we need to give time for the Holy Spirit. The enemy, the devil, will do everything to keep you in your place to tell you that you don't need to do this. It's for other people. It's not so much about trying to dig for something that isn't there. It's about a heart attitude that says, Lord, if there's any way in which this is me, I want to be rid of it today. And he will do exactly that. 
He will fill you afresh. He'll wipe away the darkness. He will certainly set you on your feet for another chance. And as He does that, His grace will be present to help you after this, if it's necessary, to go and make right whatever it is that He has spoken to you about. Again, not in condemnation or false belief, but under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we are so grateful for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, we thank you that you see into the heart of every man. There is nothing hidden from your sight. So, Father, thank you for my brother here that has come forward, opened his heart to receive from you. Father, I thank you for a mighty washing and cleansing and a refilling and overflowing a fresh baptism in your mighty Holy Spirit see Father the repentance of his heart stretch out your hand and heal Lord in Jesus name hallelujah Father God there's a heart that is hungry Father for more of you Lord, I thank you that your word says that healing is as the children's bread. That it's as necessary as bread is to children, so is healing to us. And I thank you, Father God, that you've made provision through the death and suffering of your son. Father, I thank you for wisdom, a fresh impartation. Lord, Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Flow, mighty Holy Spirit. Break through the damn wall, Lord. Break through, break through. Break through is the word to you today. Break through. The Lord wants to break through in new ways in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much. Lord, how you delight in hearts that are hungry for you. Mighty God, you don't ask us to be highly educated or clever or anything but who we really are. Father, I thank you just as you've been to me, Lord, an uneducated man. So you are here today, the same God. And Lord, I pray for my brother. Lord, for your love to envelop him, to totally surround him, for him to have a new sense of safety and security that you are saying to him, my son, all is well. I've got you. I've got you. I see your heart. And I have cleansed and wiped away those things that you have believed are holding you back. They no longer have power, my son. They're done with. They're out of the way. You can be all that I've called you to be. And I have more for you, says the Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. No more weeping, says the Lord, but joy in the Holy Ghost. I have seen your heart. I've seen your service. I know who you are, says the Lord. And I've seen your tears. But you can wipe away the tears, says the Lord, because I'm filling you now with an overwhelming joy and a fresh revelation of who I really am to you, that I've been with you from the very beginning, that the enemy has come against you and the enemy has tried to raise up strongholds. But know this, says the Lord, I cancelled it all at the cross. I'm for you, not against you. And I'm bringing you into a new land, says the Lord, that you didn't even know of. See if I will not do it, says God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Mighty God. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you that you don't want us to live a life of regret. Yes, we've made mistakes. We, if we dwell too much on the past, we can't help wishing that it could have been different. But Lord, we are thankful that in spite of our mistakes, the past is gone. It's behind us. 
cannot be lived again. And it's time to enjoy the future, the blessings of the promised land. More of you, Lord. More of you. More of you for her, Lord. More of you. More of you. Pour out your spirit, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Pour out your spirit. Yes. Yes, just receive. Father, you see a heart that's open. Can you feel? Can you feel in your spirit? God is warming your spirit. He's taking you out of that cold place that you've been in. He's warming you up, bringing you back to life and joy and gladness. Focus on the goodness of God in your life. God says to you, my child, I'm not done with you yet. Oh, no. No, no, I'm not done. There's still more. You're not too old. You're not too old. I have more for you, says the Lord. Just listen for my voice and I'll tell you what to say, says God in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Mighty God. Father, thank you. You know where my brother has come from. You know the burdens that he carries, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that today your word to him is release those burdens, cast them unto me, for I care for you. I care about you, says the Lord. I'm working. I have a plan for your life. And nothing that has happened before, if you will obey me, can hold you back from all that I want to give you. Know this, says the Lord, that there is victory. Yes, there is mighty victory in the name of Jesus. The blood of my son has cleansed you and you are no longer under condemnation. I have declared you not guilty, says the Lord. Not guilty, not guilty. In Jesus' name. And now, Lord, thank you for an extra portion of your mighty Holy Spirit to flood him every every corner of his well-being, of his being, Lord. Shine your light, Lord, into every dark place. Every, open every closed door and fill it with your presence, Lord. All those things that have been locked away. Hallelujah. We command every evil spirit that has held you in mental bondage. In the name of Jesus, we command you to release him. You go out of him now in the name of Jesus. You have no place. Out of his own mouth, he confesses his Savior, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for total victory. We break every addiction in the name of Jesus. Everyone. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for total freedom in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for a soft heart. Lord, for a joyful spirit. And Lord, there are things that no man can know that only you can see. But thank you, Lord, that you see everything from the very moment of conception. No matter how it was accomplished, Lord, you were there. You were with her in the womb and you have brought her through life to this very place today. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy that wants to just do a new thing in her life, Lord. Feel the Lord wants to just wipe away sadness and grief. And the Lord wants you to bring into a whole new place of life that is not based on what went before, but is a new thing. The Lord will say to you, behold, look and see, I'm doing a new thing in your life. Will you not be aware of it? Yes, says the Lord, I know and I love you totally. You are mine, says the Lord. No one can pluck you out of my hand in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit to fill her this morning, to bring about total release, a whole new realm of life, um, and especially in relationship, Lord, to sense. Yeah. Thank you that you're doing a new thing, Lord. Thank you for healing. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just rejoice together for young people who just start out totally yielded to you, Lord. 
Father, we know that in that the enemy will try to oppose and the enemy will lie and the enemy will steal and the enemy will cheat. But we give him no glory because he's defeated. No glory. And Father, we thank you for the greatness of your power to deliver every soul from affliction, from sorrow, from grief, from regret. And thank you, Father, that you're doing a whole new thing. That you see, mighty God, the repentance. Now, Lord, we thank you that you stretch out your hand to her and you say to her, Stand up, my child. Stand up. Stand here by my side, says the Lord. Hold on to me, for I am with you. And I will never leave you, for I have called you, says the Lord. Victory is yours, says Jesus. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you just pour out your spirit. Refresh, Lord. Refresh, take away the weariness, restore the sleep. Hear the cry of the heart, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for power on high to carry her in victory for every challenge. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand together in the presence of the Lord this morning. If you're out there and you didn't feel moved to come up, it's okay. It's okay. God can meet you right there in your chair where you are. Hallelujah. Now let's just raise our hands and give thanks to God for His mighty work in this place this morning. We serve an amazing, amazing God. We have no idea of how far His love goes towards us. We can do the worst of things and He still loves us. And you need to know that if you're here this morning and you've heard in your head that God loves you, I'm telling you today, if you'll allow Him, His Holy Spirit will touch you in your heart, in your spirit. And you'll start out with a second chance, wherever you need it. And so, Father, we thank you this morning as our people raise their hands and as their arms are open to receive. Father, thank you right now that you pour out your Spirit. You know the condition of every heart. You know exactly what they're facing, the challenges, Even the challenge of faith. Not able yet to make that step. But thank you, Father, that you said that you've given each of us a measure of faith. Help them to activate it, Lord. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you today and this week as you go out into the world. Know this, that your God is right beside you. His Holy Spirit is with you to counsel you and to help you to live for Him and to shine for Him. I love you all so much. Bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a couple things that I would like you to do. Hit the subscribe button, rate, and review the podcast. And if you'd like to invest in helping us reach more people for Christ, head over to mywordoflife.church and click the online giving button. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you again next time.